end. I'm going to do a quick introduction of Tony before we get into his um, extraordinary new book. Um, Tony's grown up in Fitzroy, has been part of the community there, a well-known First Nations writer. Um, he started as a historian, became a really important voice in academia, but has moved to become one of our most important um, writers. Uh, he's written across poetry, short stories, and of course, novels. He's um, a novel, uh, his uh, collection of short stories last year, Dark as Last Night, won the Christina Stead Literary Prize and the Still Rudd Literary Award. But he's also written a couple of other extraordinary novels, particularly Blood um, and uh, The White Girl. I highly recommend you diving into his body of work. Um, but as I said, his most recent novel is this one, Women and Children. Um, I thought when I read it, it was your best, but now that we've been reflecting over the last couple of sessions about the others, I'm not sure I've got a clear winner. Um, but this is a wonderful book that um, explores some complex themes. So the story um, starts from the perspective of Joe, young boy who lives with his mother, Marion, and his sister, Ruby. Um, he spends the summer holidays with his uh, grandfather, Charlie, while Ruby is away uh, for the summer. And during this time, his aunt Una, Marion's sister, comes to stay. And there, Joe notices the bruises on her body. And we start to get into um, a story of um, violence, but also of a family's uh, tenacity and love and strength. So like many of Tony's books, um, there are strong thematics around the power of the relationships within family between parents and children, but also amongst siblings. But also um, I think Tony's very good at looking at the way children navigate very adult worlds and looking at people who live with undercurrents of violence often on the periphery. So um, I gave a broad brushstroke of the story. Um, I thought maybe, Tony, you might like to fill in some of the gaps as you see it in relation to the story. Yeah, um, I think firstly that um, I suppose the motivation in, in writing the book, um, the story is witnessed, not entirely, but to some extent through the um, character Joe, who's 11 years old, and then also the impact of what occurs in the novel on his older sister, Ruby, who is 13. And I, I do like writing children and young teenage characters. I think often they're the most honest characters in a book that I write. And that while the adults in this book try to explain issues in a particular way to the children and in some ways to protect them, the children themselves have much more insight into what's happening in the round than we might think. So I love that interaction between um, kids and adults. I wanted to write a book, and even though the, yeah, there is a perpetrator of violence in this book, he is external to the, the Clooney family. So a little like the white girl in the sense of the dynamic between um, Odette Brown and her granddaughter Sissy in that book, the dynamic within the family itself is very loving and very secure. So both Joe and Ruby have a, a, a very caring mother. She's, she's a bit of a hard ass in some ways, but she's very caring. And particularly the relationship between Joe and um, his grandfather Charlie, and also a relationship that he develops with Charlie's best mate, um, Ranji. And in that sense, what I wanted to convey was that the influence on a boy in particular and growing men is a, actually a very productive and, and loving relationship, but it is insufficient in the sense of either Joe's ability to understand what's happening around him or the ability of his grandfather to, to really be able to do something comprehensive to, to protect his, his daughter who is the victim of of violence. So that that was vital. And I think the other thing that is a, a, a narrative running through this is um, 
the <clears throat> complexities of religion and spirituality so that um, Joe goes to Catholic school. Um, he's absolutely fearful of, of hell, which he takes as a literal um, place. So he fears the, the pain that you experience when you spend an eternity in hell. His sister Ruby has a sort of very strategic relationship. She's hedging her bets around religion but knows how to play the good Catholic girl to stay out of trouble. And Charlie himself, although a, a very lapsed Catholic, um, he, he, he comments at one point later in the novel that he's, he's given up on the church but he hasn't given up on God. He doesn't really know where he sits with that. And then his friend Ranji, who's his best mate who runs a scrap metal yard, uh, Ranji is, is a Muslim and Joe sees Ranji praying one morning and yeah, we get a sort of insight into Ranji's um, spiritual influences but there is also a point in the novel where um, Ranji says to Charlie, I don't think today is a good day to pray, reflecting on the fact if you've really sinned, maybe it's not a good time to talk to God. So in all of those instances, and of course there's the instance where the two sisters go and seek assistance from the church with the parish priest who's a very patriarchal figure and they get, they get nothing. So all of that backdrop is, I suppose, what you might think about the violence of domestic violence being in the foreground of the novel, but also the violence and hypocrisy of the church being also vital. I mean, particularly for the boy who, who suffers corporal, corporal punishment a lot at school. So he really suffers um, at school. So his life is actually, in a direct sense, he is more likely to um, be a victim of violence at school than he is, of course, in the street or at home. So I, I see those um, relationships as integral because they both attest to the contradictions and the hypocrisy that surrounds what happens to this family. Just want to dig into how you've created very distinctive responses to the domestic violence situation between the male characters and the female characters in the book. Um, like the white girl, the female characters in the book are really strong, not just the sisters but also Ruby and even the grandmother Ada mm -hmm. is still a very much a presence in the book. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you positioned the men in the book in relation to the domestic violence and then how you've positioned the women in relation to their response to how they yeah. deal with it. And I, I mean, I didn't really understand it fully until I'd finished. But Charlie is a wonderful man, um, a wonderful figure. He's a, he's a grandfather in his 60s, like me, a great grandfather. And... Um, because of that, he, he loves his family dearly, but he lives in a time when domestic violence is either ignored, is treated as secrecy, but more importantly is the business of the family. So regardless of what's happening inside a family, you don't interfere with that story or that violence. And at a point in the novel when he, he he's clearly deeply, deeply angry about what has happened to his daughter, he initiates a response that would result in him having to act in a violent manner himself. But he's unable to. He's completely inept. And I don't say that as a criticism. He's just not a man capable of that level of violence. And therefore what you realise is that because he is so loving, he cannot really do anything to help his daughter because no one is going to stop this figure by reasoning with them, talking to the police. No one will intervene. So what you find with Charlie in the end is that he's at a, a loss to do anything. So he's completely disempowered. And that to me is important. When summary justice is the only means of justice, people like him who are good people are really completely disempowered. So him and his friend Ranji, who I really enjoyed writing as a character, 
and Ranji is a, both of those men, by the way, are sort of amalgams or more just my tribute to my great great uncle, um, Ranji Moody, who was a Barbadian Aboriginal Irish man who was Australian boxing champion during the First World War, and my great grandmother's second husband, um, Bhutta Khan, who was a man from the Punjab. And those men are the only two men I, I remember through family as being men who wouldn't react with violence, even though um, Les Moody had been a boxer. So both of those men represent value in male figures, but because of the men they are, it's the men around them who are dangerous. So um, obviously Ray Lomax is the partner of Una, who is a very dangerous man. But it was important to write him. I didn't write him as a sort of a criminal figure. He is, in a sense, a bit removed from that world. He runs an electrical goods store. So I didn't want to sort of, you know, create a stereotype of, as a criminal thug. And you tell they're the sort of men who do this. In some ways, he's outwardly more respectable than other men. There is, of course, um, Marion's ex-husband, Stan, who is a career criminal, but not directly violent. But his contradictions become obvious when he has to make a decision based on his own business interests and helping his ex-wife and of course he's he sides with his own interests and then the other figure the male figure is the parish priest and you've got to think about this time the catholic church really looming over this community and the, the parish priest having a lot of power and the decision that he makes after he has been told what has happened to Una is also reflective of, of you know, deep hypocrisy. So in a sense, there are no men, good or bad, in the novel that can really come to the aid of the women in the novel. And I think the, the, then the two adult women, um, Una, who's the younger sister, and Marion, the older sister, Una is the sister, the younger sister, who had been more carefree and a bit reckless when she was younger. And what you realise early in the novel is that since she's become partner to this Ray, it's completely really destroyed her energy. You know, she's so debilitated emotionally. I mean, we know the physical impact of violence on people who go through this, but the humiliation. The people, I think people often may not understand the level of humiliation for a woman to walk down the street when I was a kid who after being beaten by her husband or as children being part of that or witnessing that, it's a shocking, because you know everyone knows what's happened to you and they're looking at you, but they don't say anything. So that humiliation. And then, of course, Marion being a much more stoic character, but a, at you know, two points in the novel, her eruption is, is the most visceral of any character. And that was important as well to say this woman who has the most self-control and you know, she talks to her sister at one point of after separating from her husband, she'd never been in another relationship with a man and her sister ridicules her about that or tries to. But Marion's response is to say, I, I, you know, this is my life. No man controls my life. And she had made that decision. So she's very stoic, very controlled. She's very good with her kids, but not that are outwardly affectionate. And then there are two moments in the novel where she, the, you know, she erupts. And I think that was important as well to, to highlight that this man who acts with violence, in the end, he, he, affect, he affects everyone in the book in various ways. And people act in ways that you may not think. So with Charlie and not giving it away, when there is the opportunity to do something you think he is going to do something that he doesn't do. It is a little surprising, but in the end, it's about saying who is really going to, sorry, what decisions are people going to make when they're on that, under that level of stress, including Ray himself, who, yeah, I think the great deception that men go through when they assault their families or, you know, assault a woman, they, they do, start, I mean, that shocking power that they hold over an individual or their family, it starts to become delusional to the extent where they, they actually feel 
enormous strength. They haven't realised that all they've done is act in a very cowardly way towards a woman and a child and they start to have delusions about how powerful they are. And he has a, a very delusional moment about how he sees his ability to impact on others. Marion's such a great character. I actually felt like she reminded me a lot of my own mother when I was reading it. But you've also created a really powerful character with, with Ruby, even though she's not there for um, part of the book when she's away. We don't see her, but she comes back and you sort of can see she's got the same the same strength in it, in, in her, that she's already got a lot of agency for a young girl. Yeah, and it, this sounds odd. No, it doesn't sound odd. I could see Ru Ruby coming a long time so that um, – in the novel, the white girl, Sissy, who's also 13 years old, is a very different girl in the sense that because Sissy is so protected by her dead, her grandmother, she's actually quite naive. She doesn't realise as an Aboriginal girl with fair skin in the country town of how much potential danger she faces. She understands how that colour works and the discrimination, but there's a moment in that book where she goes riding off on her push bike, you know, having a great adventure and not realising that a young Aboriginal girl out on a country road on her own is, you know, the potential for danger is so real and she is confronted by a very in a very dangerous moment. Um, Ruby would never have done that. And um, I noticed that in short stories I started to write in Common People and Darkest Last Night, I was writing more female characters of around that age and they were getting tougher and tougher. And that's not surprising because I think some of these characters are modelled on you know, both my older sister and younger sister. But in um, Darkest Last Night, I have a story called Flight. And it's a beautiful story about a boy. And I think the boy and girl sort of are composites of these characters. A boy who meets an old man on a hilltop and the old man is flying a kite. And the old man teaches the boy to fly the kite. But we know the old man has sort of the beginnings of dementia. And when he sees the boy again, he forgets the boy and then he remembers him. And at some point, the old man realises he is losing his memory. So he leaves the kite for the boy and doesn't come back. And the boy starts to fly the kite and then a, group, a gang of older boys steal the kite from him and, and he goes home in tears. And his sister automatically says, I'm going to get the kite. And the boy is so fearful of these older boys, he doesn't want him to do that. She marches down to the hilltop where the boys are and while, she, while the younger boy's been gone, they've, they've broken the kite, smashed and there's a big stake, um, a wooden stake. So she just picks the stake up and stabs one of the boys just straight through the thigh with it, you know, without hesitation, then gathers all the bits of the kite together and carries them home, doesn't tell her brother what had happened. And I could see, so I can see these, these girls coming. And when I um, started to write this book, I was surprised that in the initial stages, I had the idea of Ruby going away and not coming back until it was all over. And then I, I started to realise that wasn't what I wanted. And I love the way that when she comes back, she talks about having been taught to fight. And we all know that which in the last few years, how loaded that term is, fight like a girl, and how it's become a, you know, a, 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 a slogan of strength and vitality. And I mean, it helps that I have four daughters and a granddaughter who can all fight. But um, she comes back and she tells her brother how she learned to fight. And then there is a pivotal moment again in the novel where she has to stand up for herself. So I, I, it's not surprising that um, that's what happened. And I think that when I started to draw on personal memories of the situation in our family, it was always my older sister who was at the forefront of protecting her younger siblings, not my older brother. And that's nothing against him, but, you know, she had the sort of the, she was just very stubborn and, and, and wouldn't sort of take a backward step. And I, 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 st I think that's really important in my family to think about in contemporary society. Well, we know that domestic violence is an ever-present threat. We know that it occurs right across society and we hope that there are means to change that institutionally and culturally. But 
in my family situation, it's still the case that it's women in my family who say no more. And without those women taking very direct action um, and confronting, like if my older sister saw a man in the street so well, she would she would just go she'd be up in that person's face and someone might say oh hang on that's a bit dangerous she could not she could not not intervene she just won't she wouldn't tolerate that sort of stuff so ruby i think reflects that that um that toughness and and love that that i see in in my sister but also i've seen that in various ways in my own children i think it's an achievement of the book it means we're looking at the, a, a very serious situation of the, as you say, the, the um, huge impact of domestic violence on a broad range of people, but we don't see victimhood in that way. We see people who are victims of the violence, but they're not weak characters. And I think that's no. a really important part of the story. And uh, that's probably one of the greatest challenges. So, in my first book, which is now 16 years ago, Shadow Boxing, I wrote a story called The Butcher's Wife, which was about domestic violence. It was based on a real life case of my mother's friend being terribly assaulted by her husband in, in the street, which is why it mattered. People saw it and she murdered him in real life and she cut his head off, cut his arms and legs and deposited his body around the suburb. I wrote a fictional version of that. And to this day, it astounds me that that woman, and as a historian, I went back through the court transcripts to reassure myself, she was actually acquitted. She wasn't found like guilty by insanity or what, she was acquitted, even though the judge knew what she'd done. And the judge said in his summary, considering the gross indecencies this woman had suffered, which is code for rape in marriage, um, I can't imagine her acting in any other way. So the judge in 1963 mm. said, why wouldn't she do what she did? And a lot of my my work on that in that area since has been to try and balance the realities of how this crime impacts on families and women in particular, but also their children, and do it in a way which which says when you are the victim of such a crime, it has a profound effect on your life for your whole life. But for me, how do you do that without being a voyeur or how do you do that without pity? And one of the ways I do do it, I don't, I don't describe the act of violence ever. I mean, I think I did a little bit in that first book, but in this book, while we know, we see the evidence or the aftermath of what Ray has done to Una, there is no passage in that book which is a description of violence which I make a conscious decision of. But at the same time, I, I wouldn't want to soften, I don't want to soften the impact of it. I don't want to shy away from the impact of that on, on the characters. And what you see in the book is, of course, the incredible resilience of this family, but it's not, you don't want to write a fantasy ending. You realise that, yeah, there's a, a moment about halfway during the book when Una and Marion have a really terrible argument in the street. And Marion tells her sister, don't come, next time he hits you, don't you come in my house, which is a horrible thing to say. And what we know even in that scene is Una is making herself a sacrificial lamb because she doesn't want, if she stays at her sister's and the guy comes to that house, he's gonna visit that house with violence. So Una wants to protect her sister and her nephew and niece from witnessing a terrible, incident but to do it she has to go back to the man her sister really is so angry with her but that again is the reality of what i've seen that where women will be arguing about what has occurred when in fact they couldn't have done anything to to stop it and again it's part of that is the anger mixed with a sense of humiliation, I think. The other thing I think you handle very deftly is the many ways in which different aspects of society almost work together to add to the silence and complicity. So you have the general norm that's ex accepted that you don't ask people about their bruises, that kids know 
you don't ask about bruises. People in the street, as you mentioned, don't ask about that. The church has its own um, way of um, not taking responsibility for what happens in those spaces. And the police are not mm. um, agents of, of, of um, being able to prevent this from happening or being interested in intervening. Um, all of these things conspire. Can you talk a little bit about how you were able to use all of these um, different elements to just show how alienated or how alone uh, families are in these situations? Yeah, um, I mean, a couple of things that are important there are that, I mean, there is a sort of something, there is also the impact of writing about this that it might seem odd to say this, that I'm not writing about violence in this book because I see this as, you know, that's my turf, I love writing about domestic violence, or I want to make a statement. I actually, this sounds odd, you can respond in those ways. So if someone says, why are you writing about domestic violence in this novel, you could make a grand statement of trying to, you know, make change. But at heart, I actually don't, I feel very different. I feel this is a legitimate story. And it's a, I actually think it's a, it's an odd question to ask and it implies why, when someone says, why do you write this, uh, there's an implication of you shouldn't write this or that people are embarrassed to hear about it or to read about it. Whereas I just think, no, this is, this is a story that it's about love and it is about love and its ability to confront violence. There is a sense that I think that a legacy of my mother's refusal to be as silent on this issue, I want to pay respect to that, but it's not, again, an autobiographical story. I just, I, I think, well, domestic violence is a part of Australian life. So if you want to write about going to the beach, write about going to the beach, you're as entitled to write about domestic violence and it shouldn't be someone we cringe around, you know, unless you're just fixated with happy ending stories, which I don't do. Um, <laughs> So I, I, that, that annoys me a little sometimes, but I suppose in going to what I wanted to convey in it. So two things, it's a historical story. So it is something based on a period of my childhood. So it's a period I, I know very well. And I think that, again, that whole of the Catholic Church and sort of patriarchy in the home and the damage that it does is something I wanted to explore. And again, if we think of women or female agency, it's got to be some it can only come from a woman that you know men what well basically the men in the novel good men really good men loving men and, and bad they're useless in the sense that they can make they none of, there are no men in this novel that can help or save these women so that's why then of course i'm interested in what are the contemporary resonances of this? So that's more about how a book like this is received in 2023. And while there have seen, well, while there have been changes in relationship to issues of domestic violence, it's still deeply ingrained in Australian society. Um, there are still many, many families who would suffer this in silence. And I'm intrigued. So other people have also said to me, oh, why don't you write about domestic violence in middle class life? One is I don't know how to interrogate middle class life in fiction. That I just don't know how. But it's an odd question to ask me because most writers are middle class and I'm not going to go into, of course I'm materially middle class now. I get that. I've never heard someone say to a middle class writer, why don't you write about domestic violence? So yeah. it seems to say that secrecy that is part of middle class life, it also comes with privacy, which is, we talked this morning, there's a big difference here. If you live in a poor working class home at the time, and even now, if you live in an Aboriginal family, the thought that a policeman or a woman couldn't just come in, into your house when they want to, a social worker couldn't come into your house when they want to, there is no sense of privacy. Privacy is a luxury you, you just don't have. Whereas in middle class life, and we're talking with the lawyers this morning, if a man who was a middle class man who happened to be a lawyer, if, the, if he was suspected of domestic violence, one of the, our friends this morning was saying, the police would probably ring his lawyer <laughs> first, you know, we want to talk to your client. They, whatever they do, they were not going to go and just knock his front door down. So 
So it's about the fact in a contemporary sense, I'm interested in the fact that how is this issue dealt with today? And the other issue there is my older sister worked in this um, domestic violence and Aboriginal women's health for many years. And despite the so-called changes, I can tell you now that programs that my sister's been involved in have more likely to have their funding cut than increased, even in recent years. So women are getting less help. The other thing is, I think, how do police react? And I think it's, I've, in, this is how the, you, you know in this novel, the notion of contacting police is the least likely notion. I had thought of putting a scene in where Marion goes to the police station, but that would be like, that would be an ultimate fantasy. The, that's, the policeman would be the last person she would contact, right? So I've only ever called the police once in my life and it was last year when a woman across the road from me had was been assaulted by a partner, I suspected once, then I suspected highly twice, and then I, I knew. So I called the police. And I have to say the police that came were were fantastic. They 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 wouldn't let it go. They they knocked on the door for the guy wasn't there, they came back. Um, they came back and visited me, they came back and told me what had occurred. He'd been taken from the house. Um, so in that instance, and it wasn't maybe because one of them was a very assertive policewoman, but maybe I didn't feel they were doing something under duress or doing something because they had to. So whatever policies have been put in place, that those two police officers, and I know it's not reflected across the board, we would know that, they seemed to take it very seriously and did what, and this is two houses, two commission places next door to each other across from me. A woman in the other house said that, I didn't say I'd called the police, but she said how this other woman was, that fortunately got rid of this man. So you hope those, there are changes, but we know that that is really spasmodic and that can change very dramatically. We know that many Aboriginal women still wouldn't even get a look in with police. So it's, it's such a long journey to, to make change happen. It's um, true when I was looking back over my notes for the sessions today and I sort of obviously because it's a, a festival that looks at crime was thinking of the novel as a novel that explores domestic violence but it's true if you look back on it it's really a story about love and particularly the story of the love between the two sisters. I want to ask you about a couple of other things in the book that are not so much about the uh, domestic violence plot line that's through it. Um, Joe's a wonderful character. We, we come into the story through his eyes um, and his view of the world. But there's a scene that you've got in the book where um, he's at school and they're painting and he paints his own face black. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what you're exploring with that thread well, of story. I was firstly trying to freak my publisher out. <laughs> she wrote back and said, blackface, we can't have blackface. <laughs> and it's quite funny, I did a reading of that scene um, at a seminar I held at Melbourne Uni in the first half of the year and one of my friends, um, Maxine Beneva Clark, who's a black African background, was in the audience and my publisher kept looking at Maxine, <laughs> is Maxine getting uncomfortable, which, which she wasn't. So. Um, it is based on a, a, a true life incident that involved me as a child. But I suppose there, there are issues there is that it's about Joe recognising prejudice and racism, but not being quite clear about it. And it plays out through, um, there are these money boxes that, and I'm, I'm sure people have seen versions of them. I went to a Catholic school where in every classroom there was a, a black uh, metal money box of a, a a, a dark, a real caricature really of a, a, a black faced boy with big red lips and these were called Black Sambo, these money boxes. He held out a metal hand and if you put a coin into his hand, the weight of course would drop the hand and then it, some spring in the mechanism would open, drop the boy's mouth and the coin would flip back into his mouth. So you're encouraged to bring coins into school and put them in the hand of the, the statuette and then the statuette would swallow the money. You know, it's a great trick to get kids to give money to charity. And it was supposedly for the poor children in the islands, whoever, whoever those children were. And uh, both in the novel and in reality, 
a lot of the kids would like would tease the statue like I was about six when I did this and scream at him black sambo eat it eat it and yell at the statue and really in a violent way and as a kid you know coming out of a family of Aboriginal you know a black faced great grandmother and uh, my grandmother I'd never met she died I was really I'd be really anxious and upset but couldn't really articulate it so like Joe in the, in the story and we know in the novel he has a grandmother a woman of color who we know has been removed from family but that remains a mystery in this story and that was quite deliberate um, when I grew up in Fitzroy there are a lot of kids who knew they had a past that was secret and it might be an Aboriginal grandmother it could be another you know colored um ethnicity but it was you it was another secret i suppose so in the novel and in real life he is asked or invited to paint a portrait of any face in the room and the girl next to him of course paints the blonde haired blue eyed jesus christ on the wall who looks like a surfer <laughs> the only surfer in middle east at the time jesus was um, she paints Jesus because she loves Jesus and the boy doesn't know who to paint and then he sees the statuette and he decides to paint his face black the same as the statue I did that as a kid and then the other part of that is when the nun sees what the boy has done she is horrified you might think she's horrified because yeah black face is not what you should be doing it's not that it's the embarrassment of what this boy he, he conveyed that blackness on his own skin he has a dark dark birthmark on his face so he wants his face to be one color not a mixed color which is you know there's a metaphor there obviously and then the nun drags him out of the classroom by the back of the scruff of his neck which again happened to me and then almost drowns him in a bucket of water which also happened to me so it is about juxtaposing that again that level of violence from the nun and the hypocrisy around the, this colored figure in the novel the boy then of course um, steals the, the the money box and takes it home what I didn't put in the novel because in the in the novel when his mum finds out or when he she doesn't believe it's possible but I this is again how much power the church had in the real life story when I went home that night and my face sort of had still you know bits of black on it but I had my still remember well from memory my my shirt collar was wet my mum said what happened I said I painted my face black and um, the nun stuck my head in the bucket of water my mum said well, it serves you right mm -hmm. so my family like many families handed you over to the church so if you came home with really you know badly bruised um, palms from being strapped no one ever well no, no one that I knew of and certainly not in my family your parents didn't say oh, I've, yeah th this is not on you would actually hide your your bruises because that was another secret you wouldn't want your mum to know that you'd been given the cuts as we used to call it because she would know that you had done something wrong so there was never any sense that I got as a kid that what was happening at school and then in the Christian brothers they they strapped you even more that it wasn't appropriate and I mean at the Christian brothers you get the strap for having dirty shoes it was really systematic and quite mild and I don't think I remember going to Christian Brothers without seeing a kid strapped at least once a week and it would be in the classroom on the platform so you would all see it and legally I don't think you could strap a kid more than six but these were very thick leather straps so standardized they were every Christian brother had one and yeah three of those on each hand it, they did a lot of damage and I don't remember a parent ever complaining about it. and I think that's why we were sent there the uh, our parents were saying, we can't control him maybe the Christian brothers can it's another powerful you mentioned it earlier that that sitting beside the domestic violence is this um, corporal punishment of children that's happening I've got one more question before I'll ask you to do a reading and see if there are any questions and um, I think there's a couple of ways in which you create real warmth of family in this novel despite having a very strong um, story in there of, of this um, domestic violence um, uh, s story, the plot. And I think two ways that it felt to me like you were bringing that warmth were 
the amounts of times you used the kitchen table and the kitchen as a site of warm domesticity, but also the way in which you use the tradition of storytelling within a family. There's Charlie's tale of the talking dog and Una's tale of the girl who runs away to the circus. And those lovely stories within a story that, that are a part of your work, but they have a role to play here. And I wondered if you might reflect on why you chose those ways to bring about the warmth of family and domesticity. I did think at one point that um, I said to Viva Tuffield, who's my publisher, have we had too many cups of tea? <laughs> Yeah, you know, and I understand this very well. Yeah, you know, people sort of, some academics, not all of them shit can, you know, what they call realism. And then you think of the old, you know, term of kitchen sink dramas. I have, all my stories have, yeah, you know, there's a lot of kitchen sink drama or kitchen table drama, but I'm happy to wear that. And in a sense, the kitchen table, and I mean this, you know, literally, not as an adult, but growing up, the house's configuration. So when we lived in Fitzroy, there was a front room, a middle room, a kitchen. And the front room was my parents' bedroom and lounge room. They had five kids in the second room and then the kitchen. So everything really happened in the kitchen. Now, partly that's by necessity. So we didn't have a bathtub or a shower. So we, 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 we bathed in a metal tub in the kitchen. So everything really happened in that kitchen space. So it's not surprising that that's part of my memory. But, you know, the loving thing of sitting, because my grandmother lived next door, you know, you, you could ask any of my siblings, you know, it, what's their fondest childhood memory of sitting around the kitchen table when, particularly when the men aren't there, when they've gone to the pub or gone to work and your mum's there, your grandmother, my auntie would be there and your cousins and you're sitting around the table drinking tea and having, I don't know if people know the concept of broken biscuits. You could go to the, so in those days in the milk bar, there were no packet biscuits. They came in these brock off tins, they're probably about two gallon tins. And you'd say, I'll have two shawns of mixed biscuits, or you might just go for, if you're really having a jazzy night out, you know, you'd go for sort of chocolate royals or something, but you don't get about four of them. <laughs> but when in those tins, as the milk bar on a soul, his name was, get down, you don't be left with broken biscuits, you know, and you could go and ask for two shillings of broken biscuits, and you get this massive bag. <laughs> and yeah, you know, some of them would be little bits, but yeah, you know, my mum would say, look, I've got a teddy bear and so I've got a foot missing. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, now that's that's nostalgic. I don't, and I'm, see, I'm not, again, in your academia, nostalgia is a dirty word. If you want to know the real value of nostalgia, you've got to hang around Arnold Zabel. He really yeah. gets to the heart of it. So in non-English Europe, nostalgia is, is really valued, basically. So we really value, and in Aboriginal communities, that love and nostalgia around what families do is vital. So the kitchen table was obviously a place of great um, joy. And that's why there's one of the explosions in this novel, well, both of them really initiated in the kitchen. So I did also want to juxtapose that piece because Charlie's got a very loving um, room as well. So um, all my memories of life around the kitchen are all, always very loving. So it's not surprising. It's why I've, you know, in my bourgeois life, I said to my wife the other day, I'm sick of open plan. <laughs> <laughs> I want, you know, everyone's in this big space. Of, and I, like, I think I need like a little, I've got a, in our house, there's a, there's a cubby room where you open a door and it's probably about three feet by three feet with all my grandkids' toys. And that's the best space in the house. You know, I think I, <laughs> that's where I'd like to retreat to. So, that, so, so that, that that is one of them. What was the second one? Oh, it's the storytelling. Yeah, so I did that in this novel, which is obviously so. It's interesting that you know when you think of the Old Testament and the notion of a parable, is that yeah you know, when I went to school and like um, Ruby, I was I was a great student. I used to like catechism. You get a hundred questions. You know why must I be you know faithful to God? I must be faithful to God because if I'm not, I'm, I'm fucked, you know. So um, you get these questions that you had to answer and I always got them right. And the parables that this is how you do this, this is how you do that. Our family and our community, there were what you call marquee stories that are the parables of how you live. So there are several stories in this book which are handed down generationally to um, explain issues. One that I, I'll tell a very quick one because my this this shows how 
how fractured, you know that thing you on television called fractured fairy tales? Mm -hmm. This is my mum's favourite story. And it's a true story, but of course she embellished it. So my grandfather was a career criminal and one of his friends was a very well-known career criminal and a very violent man. But he was friends with my grandfather and he was fine with our family, but very dangerous around other people. One night there was a party at our house and someone said, and I won't name him, someone said, oh, so-and-so's coming with your grandfather. And my mother said, oh, shit. And my grandmother was there and my mum said, what we do? She said, oh, hide the, the wood axe, the tomahawk, because if, if he gets in a fight, he'll pick the tomahawk up and he'll hit someone over the head with it. So they hid the tomahawk. And then my grandma goes, oh, there's a pinch bar, which probably my dad was using to do burglary. So this is a pinch bar. Get the metal bar and hide the pinch bar. And then they go, oh, the knives and forks. He could stab someone with a fork or gouge their eye out with a spoon. We'll take all the cutlery and hide it and they're looking around for any sharp objects and there's nothing left right so this cr criminal comes to the house of my grandfather they go out into the backyard there's a party everyone's dancing he gets into a fight hits someone clobbers him and knocks him out cold comes into the house and says to my mum oh hi Dawny he said uh, can I borrow your axe I'm gonna go out and cut that bloke's hands off she goes oh no I'm sorry I haven't got the axe someone broke in the house last week and they stole the axe he goes, okay, he goes, you, can, you got an iron bar or a red hot poker or something I could hit him out the head with? And she goes, oh, no, 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 they stole that as well. He goes, oh, give me a knife or fork and I'll stab him in the chest. And she goes, oh, no, they stole the knives and forks. He goes, really? And then he looks on the kitchen stove and sees a, a boiler. Yeah, he said, oh, that's all right. He said, just heat that up to boiling water and I'll throw it over his face. Well, on that cheery note, would you like to give us a reading? <laughs> And what have, you cho what have you chosen to read? Okay, I'll, something more sedate. <laughs> that is a true story. I'll get my mum to tell it. She tells it better than me. Okay, so this is a really, um, it's one of those scenes. So when I wrote The White Girl, I wrote what was called the bath scene when um, Odette gives Sissy a bath and very tactile, very gentle scene. And it was the most important scene for me to write. Um, this was also a very vital scene when Ruby discovers her auntie Una and what has happened to her and she persuades her auntie Una to return to, the, to Ruby's house and it's what happens when they get there. Una sat on the front step of the house and waited for Ruby to jump the side fence, climb through a window and open the door. She helped Una inside and led her to her bedroom where she removed her dressing gown and laid her auntie on the bed. There were still more cuts and bruises on Una's body. Una asked for a glass of water. My throat's burning. Ruby sat on the side of the bed holding the back of Una's head in one hand and helping her sip from a glass of water with the other. Water ran from Una's mouth down her chin and onto her neck. Una asked for a Bex powder for her headache but once she'd taken it, she gagged and vomited the powder onto the front of her nighty. Ruby went into the kitchen and boiled the kettle. She poured the hot water into a dish and added a capful of disinfectant from a bottle she'd found in the medicine cupboard in the bathroom. She returned with a steaming bowl and a towel draped over her shoulder and a clean flannel in the other. You look like a nurse, Una said, my own Florence Nightingale. Ruby rested the dish on the dresser. The blood stains on Una's nightie were plastered to the wounds beneath them. Ruby wouldn't be able to treat Una's wounds until the nightie was removed. We'll have to take this off, Ruby said, to clean the blood away from the cuts. Ruby gathered the hem of the nightie and gently rolled the fabric up. Una did the best she could to raise her arms above her head and Ruby lifted the nightie, closing her eyes as she did so. The only grown woman she'd ever seen naked was her own mother which had not bothered either of them until Ruby reached puberty and became sensitive about her own changes. She avoided being in the bathroom at the same time as her mother. Marion understood the shift in their relationship as she'd gone through a similar experience with her mother when she was Ruby's age. Ruby opened her eyes and forced herself to look at Una's naked body. She was shocked to see multiple bruises in the shape of a belt buckle and a scabbing cut on the side of Una's ribcage. The largest bruise covers Una's left hip in the shape of a heel. 
It was an horrific sight. Ruby spoke softly to Una, asking as she lay her head on the pillow and rest, please tell me if I hurt you and I'll stop. Ruby began washing gently. She felt sadness for her auntie and she was angry. She'd seen the damaged bodies of children at school and the bruised faces of women in the street, but remained unable to imagine how one person could hurt another so badly. She began with Una's face, methodically removing dried blood from above her mouth. She cleaned Una's ears and wiped away the blood that had wept onto her shoulders. Ruby then sponged Uzi's upper bo Una's upper body, avoiding the cut on Una's ribcage as it looked too tender to touch. She rinsed the flannel in the dish and washed Una's arms and legs. The belt buckle bruising was heaviest on Una's thighs. Each bruise had a small cut in one corner, the result of a sharpened edge of a buckle breaking the skin. Ruby asked Una to raise each leg just enough so she could wash her heels and the back of her calves. She bathed Una's feet without touching the discoloured toes on her left foot. <coughs> Sorry. Una's hands were smeared in the dried blood she'd wiped from her nose and mouth. She also had blood under her fingernails. Ruby was determined to remove every drop of blood that was the result of Ray Lomax's violence. She excused herself, went into the kitchen, searched through the pantry cupboard and found a box of toothpicks. When she returned to the room, she scraped the blood from beneath the fingernails of both Una's hands with a toothpick. The colour of the water in the dish had gradually deepened from pink to red. I'd need fresh water, Ruby explained. She went back into the kitchen and emptied the dish in the sink. It was only then that she cried, briefly. She wiped the tears from her face with the same bloody flannel she'd used to clean Una's body. She filled the dish with clean water and returned to the room. Una had fallen asleep. Her deep breaths created a soft whistling sound between her swollen lips. Ruby sat by the side of the bed and noticed more blood on the, in Una's tangled hair. She parted Una's fringe and noticed a curved shape cut in the centre of her forehead. When Ruby sponged the wound with the flannel, Una opened her eyes. I'm cleaning your hair, Ruby explained. Some of it stuck together. Una moaned. I'm so sorry, Ruby said. I'll stop. Please don't, Una croaked. Touch me, please. I love it. She rested her head on Ruby's shoulder. Ruby took a handful of Una's hair and sponged it with a flannel until it was free of blood. She repeated the process until, the process until Una's hair was cl as clean as Ruby could manage. She put the bowl aside. She no longer feared looking at Una's naked body. She glanced down at her own left hand. A trace of blood had caught under her fingernail. Una looked over at her niece. Make me a promise, can you love? Yes, Ruby said, anything you want. Stay with me, please. But you need a doctor, Ruby said. I know I do, but not yet. Let me rest. Please stay here with me. I will, Ruby said. Let me get something to cl clean for you to wear. She left the room and returned with a fresh nighty. This one is mum's. Thank you. We've got time for a question or two if there's one in the audience. Yes, I get one there and then one at the front. Yep. Can you just wait for the microphone? Oh, there you okay. are, thank you. Uh, thanks for sharing that with us. That was really enjoyable. I um, was just wondering, in your Earlier you were talking about the legitimacy of writing about domestic violence because it's a legitimate story and the story to be told from Australian life. But what is the, in your view, like what motivates you to write stories at all? Um, yeah, it's a good question. And I think that I started writing about that sort of stuff. So in my first book, Shadowboxing, um, there's a strong there's a strong element of contested masculinities in it. And I think the theme in that is that it's not, certainly not an anti-male book. It's saying there are particular pathways that boys can take. And in that book, the, the child in that book, Michael, doesn't want to take the same pathway as his father. And that was very strong. And in this book, I think related to the issue of violence is that Joe is a quite a sweet child and he has this potential to be um, influenced you know, by this wonderful grandfather figure. And I suppose why I've returned to it, and I've returned to it in a way that 
is really cyclical. So it is going back to that earlier, even the way of writing stylistically, it's going back to that first book. And I think there are two things. I think that um, this might sound odd that people, yeah, we talk about intergenerational trauma and I had to see a counsellor for a while when my younger brother died very violently and suddenly about four years ago. And I had to basically see a grief counsellor for a while. And she was surprised at the level of which I don't feel, I can't recognise trauma in my childhood. I can write about it and talk about it and I can think about the implications on a character like Joe, but I, I don't feel that trauma and she's very unhappy about that. And um, but I think, to be honest, I think it's since I've got five adult children and when I, they were growing up, we, you know, I think I'm a good father or they tell me I am. And we've, we've, we, we didn't have, our home's not been a violent home. But since I had grandchildren, particularly my three younger grandchildren who are, who are boys, it's not that I don't have the same care for my granddaughter, Isabel, who's eight. What I felt really acutely in the last few years is trying to comprehend what would be, how could a child cope with witnessing violence like the violence that Joe witnesses or being subject to violence? And that has created a, a sort of residual trauma in me because I've had this um, fear, which is illogical that I don't want my grandkids to suffer that. And of course they don't suffer it. So I think it's, it's probably that the main reason is psychologically I'm still, well, psychologically more than ever, I'm trying to articulate what all this meant to me so effectively. But also that, um, yeah, we talk about where we are now and we hope we're in a better place, but I have to be quite honest and direct here that one, a very close family member to me, a younger family member, a female in a very professional capacity in her life, had a relationship with a very professional male and he subjected her to a horrific physical violence. So it's also for me to, recognise the, these hypocrisies are still there. We talked this morning about how you deal with this in the Aboriginal community, because we know that if we discuss this issue publicly, people can say, oh, this is, you know, this is what black fellows do. They, you know, domestic violence in, is endemic in your community, which it's not. It's an issue in the community as it is in all communities. But what's interesting in the Aboriginal community is that if I'm with a group of Aboriginal women who are leading a discussion or in positions of authority, it's a very important safe space to discuss these issues. If I'm in, if I was with a group of just Aboriginal men, I often find it's a very unsafe space to discuss this and it's a very defensive space. So part of it also is I think me, again, trying to articulate those, those hypocrisies, which I, I still see as ever present in my life. And I, and I see it all around me. So. To me, it, it, it's it's something that, you know, Tim Winton likes to write about the beach. I like to write about trouble. <laughs> Just one last question. Um, mine's kind of the opposite direction in that domestic violence is a very difficult thing to talk, let alone write about and share those kind of stories. What would your advice be for people that are looking to also share those stories? I think that's, I mean, again, and I, 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 you're exactly right. And when I taught writing, my first point is you don't have to, sh and I know you don't have to share any stories. So students would somewhat say that, that there was something I wanted to write about, but it was too traumatic. I would say, well, maybe it is too traumatic. And it's not, so we certainly shouldn't ask people to be confessional or to write material that is so difficult that it, it creates a trauma in them. Because, yeah, one is if you're teaching writing at a university, you don't have the professional skills to assist that person. And, yeah, very problematic. So I would always say to people, and I know joking a little bit before, but if, if you have someone, so I know people who have gone through terrible experiences and said, well, I don't want to revisit it. I want to write a happy ending. I'm entitled to let myself off the hook. 
Um, I've written a couple of happy endings and people say, oh, I don't like that happy ending. But So firstly is that you don't have to write about it and you shouldn't have to write about it. I think that you've got to be careful when you write about issues like this because it can have a really detrimental impact on you. Two other pieces of advice, one of them sounds harsh. When people do want or do decide to write about traumatic issues in their life or in fiction, <laughs> there is still a reliance to write it well. And I, you know, sometimes it's hard to say to a student, I know this issue is important to you and I know you want to write about it, and, but you've written it badly. And that, that actually matters, writing is a craft. And as harsh as that sounds, if you want people to, so for me, I'm a storyteller. The issue of violence is part of a story. It's not an issues book in the sense I didn't sit down and think, I want to expose the issue of domestic violence. I wanted to write a story about a boy and how his life is impacted on in a very positive, negative way. And that, that was part of it. So you still got to write it well. But I understand what you're talking about because just to finish, to relay another story, I don't, and this might sound, maybe it's problematic, writing this stuff, I like writing. And when I've written this stuff, I don't find it difficult to write it. I treat it as storytelling and I don't end the day going, oh, I'm, that's exhausted me. It doesn't. And I don't know if that's something about me, but I understand that. So many, many, many years ago, <coughs> the first published academic essay I ever published is an essay on an attempt to restore Indigenous place names to the Garua Grampians National Park. I was doing a lot of research which was around the massacre of Aboriginal people in the Western District of Victoria using the diaries of a man called George Augustus Robinson who had written in reports of women being raped and murdered, of children being roasted alive on fires. Um, and while I'm there with my academic sort of cap on, oh, okay, this, that's an important source and writing it down and putting it into an essay. <coughs> the day I had to deliver that paper at a conference at Melbourne University, it was in this really packed room and it sort of felt hot. And I'll never forget this great Aboriginal woman in my life, Destiny Deacon and the late Lisa Belier was sitting in the front row. And when I got to the end of the paper, which was a long 40 minute paper, and I read the last quote from George Augustus Robinson about the fact that these children had been thrown into a fire, after six months of research and writing and being cool and detached, as I tried to read it, I could, I was overwhelmed with grief and before I knew I still remember Destiny goes, oh no. <laughs> and then I just burst into tears and was inconsolable. So you've got to be, you know, we know this in the Aboriginal community when we're talking about colonial violence. So whether it be a personal story or a community story, yeah, it, it has an impact and, you, and you're entitled to protect yourself and I would never suggest that anyone goes down that road if they feel uneasy about it. But you know, when we're both of the people we were on this morning, we we're talking about one woman who experienced horrific sexual violence as a child and has fought for 20 years to have that dealt with by the police. Another of our participants had spent her whole childhood in child protection away from her parents. So this morning they were talking about traumatic experiences that had impacted on them negatively as children. But they're remarkable women working in the legal space in the Aboriginal community. So as someone listening to that, you feel really empowered by what these women have said. Whether they want to divulge that personal story, of course, it's entirely up to them. And I know Larissa knows these women really well. If we felt that those women were being emotionally impacted on by that in a negative way, we would, you would need to show care. So. My final point is if, if you're going to write about that issue, I, I think it's good to have good people around you because you need, you might need to debrief, you might need a hug, you might need someone who you want to confide in. And I think the worst thing, and we know this where, where I started with about humiliation, there's nothing worse than to carry a secret that you can't unburden in the sense of you feel isolated and, and, and alone. So that sense of feeling disempowered and lonely, writing is what you should do to, to get rid of that. But you couldn't do it unless you had good people around you. So I'd suggest anyone who wants to do that, make sure you've got good mates.
Tony will be available to sign copies of Women and Children or his other great books that are available for sale. Please join me in thanking him for being with us this afternoon.